Hello, my name is Louis Dumont, and this is 10 things in Lightwave that I wish I'd known earlier. Uh, it could be, it's, sort of, it's mainly kind of workflow related items that I think speed up massively um, how you animate, model, and render. Uh, so, yep, yeah, so here they are. Okay, this one is really handy if you have a lot of items in your scene, and you, uh, particularly for animation. So, I've got my little visiting character here, um, and I have in the scene editor, he is represented with a lot, a lot, a lot of items. So what we're going to do, or what I find super handy, is to create selection sets just for the bits that I'm animating. So I can see here, just from the keys, what's important. So if I select these controllers, uh, seems to be getting more here. Okay, nearly there. Okay, I think that's good. Um, and then save selection. I'm gonna call this uh, just animation. And from there, we can always select animation and hide, and we've got our most important keyframes, or most important items with keys. And this is really handy as well, because you can do all the kind of global time selection and stuff, moving things around, um, uh, reshaping time a bit, uh, without affecting any of the other items or any other things in the scene, which is super handy. Uh, this is really handy for copying keyframes. Um, in the Dope Sheet editor, you can, uh, I mean, what I used to do was just sort of copy and paste keyframes in a different location. But I found out quite late that you can select any number of keyframes, hold down the Alt key, and copy them across, and you've got multiple. Uh, you know, you can't see that because the animation is out of frame, but it duplicates the same thing. Uh, you can do this in the little mini dope sheet thing. You can do it in the full scene editor as well. Uh, whoop. And it's a little bit different, but you can also do something similar in the graph editor uh, by selecting the key you want to duplicate, holding down control, and right-clicking uh, where you want it to go. And there it is. Okay, so I've got a little animation here of a Google Cardboard coming together, and I... The, you can see the little black discs here are magnets, part of the construction. And one's kind of left behind and I want to position it right next to another one in here. Now, it took me a long time to realize that what you can do is, if I just move to the keyframe, is just copy that key, select the other one, paste and there it is offset it slightly and there we go okay graph editor um, let's say we've selected uh, a few important elements that we wish to animate or you wish to see the uh, in represented in animation animation curves. As you can see, we are presented with lots of information. Um, now what you can do is you could go up to channels, filter, or hit W on the keyboard, and you can filter everything out, which is super handy just to see where you are. So if I do, uh, it's just by word and it's case sensitive. If I do POS, that's enough for position because it doesn't resemble anything else. And I've just got all of the positional information for all of the items I had selected. And I can refine further 
by saying let's just have the y axis cool really handy um yeah and then i can create a favorite set just I don't know, y yeah and then whenever i want to return instead of being faced with all of this stuff i can just go to my favorites uh, this is quite handy for um, usually kind of game engine type stuff where you've got a couple of objects or characters in the scene and you've done UV, you've done a UV for both of them, um, like so. But um, let's say it is going out to a game engine and you need those all to be in one UV. Uh, well, it's a bit odd, but the way you do it is kind of like this. So you bring up your vertex maps uh, let's copy and create a new texture map called both robots okay then I've copied so I copied little bot into both robots and I'm gonna get F bot copy and call that both robots okay and now both UVs are on top of each other, which is, uh, yeah, good. Uh, this is a quick tip just to remind um, people that with, I believe, 2015, um, you can now use QuickTime um, with the 64-bit version of Lightwave. So this comes, for me, particularly in handy when um, doing previews. Uh, so here I set the save file as QuickTime you can choose H.264 um, I think you can choose like a yeah like data rate caps and everything as well which is kind of handy to keep files emailable uh, so let's make a preview And that's great. We can view our camera path and see if we're intersecting with any objects and stuff. So we're done with that. We can go save preview. Cool. And now we have a nice emailable or not email but you know fairly small, better than full uncompressed thing to send to your director or whatever. This is one that I put up with for far too long and it's um, using the transform tool or the newer transform tool within Lightways Modeler. So you've got a nice uh, ability now to stay within perspective mode and still use a lot of the common functions of uh, you know rotation, scale and position. And you can move this little gizmo about by clicking on an edge, a polygon or um, or, vert or vertices and you know move the item around really really handy um, I clicked on the button but that, that was me clicking on the shortcut and it's accompanied by a kind of Windows sound which isn't particularly nice when you select this tool a lot so um, a way to fix that is to load up the sound control panel item click on sounds and the alert I believe is exclamation no it is default default bleep so if we take that and select none okay and we go back alt T ah, nice and quiet this is a quick tip about using 32-bit depth maps in Lightwave now by default, the depth map is compressed to within the 8-bit 8 8-bit uh, 8 color space. Um, now, what happens if you want to do you want to shift focus after the render, and you want to have a large sort of a, a large amount of variable, variables to do this in? Well, you uncheck that and limit the buffer depth. To whatever you you need in the scene I usually test this by uh, switching on depth of field and I can see a representation of how far things are away so it's 
over 50 meters so I've gone to the nearest whole kind of large number um, yeah so if we do a render okay let's load our render up into After Effects got our color or beauty pass and the depth map and you can't see any values here at all it's all 255 so we need to change the project to 32 bit okay let's see all the values here grab the levels effect and change the input white to something a lot higher well that's up to our 100 meters but maybe let's take it down to 80 mm, cool and we pre-compose that move the effect in with the comp hide take your favorite cam camera lens effect filter or whatever I'm using just the default one in After Effects select our depth layer and there we go we've got a um, nice ability to refocus after the render okay this is just um, some quick settings as a starting point for animated GI and it's kinda like I guess almost a halfway house between um, interpolated and brute force because I've lowered the maximum pixel spacing down considerably um, and this scene is lit uh, it's got an area light in the window and a distant light um, and some lights in the boxes and stuff like that but for the, for the most part all of the interior here is lit with non-direct GI um, you can also turn the multiplier down as well it doesn't really hurt too much um, yeah so you can see there's still a bit of blotchiness but I think it's, you know, it's possible. Okay, I've got a scene set up and I'm ready to render. Um, now, I'd quite like a small amount of flexibility in post. So the kind of the kind of baseline render passes I tend to do are the diffuse shading, um, shaded reflection and raw RGB. Uh, save those out as 32-bit files and hit render okay um, we've got our render now if we launch After Effects loaded our buffers so raw RGB just the color and texture values shaded diffuse on top with multiply and reflections on top of that with screen and then an adjustment layer on top of that layer adjustment layer for the gamma correction so from 1 to 2.2 and finally um, just make sure we are in the full 32-bit working space for After Effects that smooths everything out and now we can adjust things you know nicely we turn down reflections and if we had uh, I'll do another tutorial I think in the future about how I like to do um, uh, object mats and stuff as well um, and this also doesn't take into account any other of the texture channels you may use like tran transparency, translucency or you know that kind of stuff but for now it's kind of nice a nice way to get started hopefully there's some bits of useful information there for you um, yeah thanks for watching